No one's favourite Bond film is their favourite Bond film because it won a bunch of awards, but there's no doubt that the Academy Awards carry a level of prestige and recognition, particularly in the rare instances when they are awarded to big budget entertainment movies like Bond as opposed to small introspective dramas about the human condition that about four people on the planet will actually remember in a couple of years' time. No Time to Die is certainly notable for being the Bond film with, I think, the biggest awards push in history, or at least it is to my mind. There were several For Your Consideration campaigns that netted the film a total of three Oscar nominations for Best Song, Best Sound, and Best Visual Effects, making it only one of three Bond films to score multiple Academy Award nominations. But given this push, the film's deliberate emphasis on character and emotional storytelling, things that the Oscars love, is it weird that the film didn't garner more nods? I mean, cinematography and production design certainly seemed a likely outcome, and editing was a possibility, and hey, Christoph Waltz as Best Supporting Actor was a, a long shot to be generous, but still, three potential statues is not a bad run by Bond film standards. This year's nomination certainly inspired me to take a look back at Bond's past Oscar achievements, though. I'll admit it's not something that I hold a great deal of stakes in, but it is kind of surprising that given Bond's history in cinema, the films don't have more Academy gold to their name, and don't worry, this isn't going to be just some fanboy ranting that a series of populist films he loves didn't win a bunch of industry awards. Except for the fact that John Barry was never nominated for any of his work on any of his Bond films, and I'm pretty sure that's an actual crime. People should be in jail for that. Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome to a brief history of Bond at the Academy Awards. Well, things get off to a pretty excellent start with the series' first two nominations both turning into wins, Best Sound Effects for Goldfinger and Best Special Visual Effects for Thunderball. I find it fascinating that in both films' cases they were only nominated against one other film. I don't know if that's just because there was a lack of entries, or just two nominations was the done thing in these categories, or hey, maybe Goldfinger and the Lively Set were the only films of 1964 that included sound effects. I mean, Mary Poppins and My Fair Lady are famous for being silent musicals, after all. Bond's 60s Oscar run continues with a Best Song nomination for Casino Royale's The Look of Love. W wait, seriously? <laughs> Really? I mean, don't get me wrong, I think that's a really great song, but of all the 60s Bond songs, like, that's the one that gets nominated? The one from the spoof movie over, I, I don't know, Goldfinger, You Only Live Twice, We Have All the Time in the World? I'm not sure what's more baffling, that or the fact that Casino Royale has every right to market itself as an Oscar-nominated movie. Into the 1970s now, where the Bond series garners a few more nominations, one for Best Sound for Diamonds Are Forever, and one for Best song for Live and Let Die. I mean, much deserved, it's an incredible song, but I'm still kind of surprised that it took this long for an official Bond song to be recognised. It turns out that we didn't have to wait too long for the next one, though, as Nobody Does It Better from The Spy Who Loved Me was nominated in 1978, along with Best Art Direction and Best Original Score. All much deserved nominations, but again, kind of surprising that it took until the 10th film in the official series for things like score and art direction slash production design to get Academy notice. Equally kind of funny, the fact that John Barry goes unrecognised for his Bond work on all of his previous films, and here comes Marvin Hamlish, and on his first film he gets two nominations, Best Score and Best Song. Now, John Barry won five Oscars over the course of his career, and I highly doubt that they've been rusted from tears he spilled for not being nominated for the likes of From Russia With Love and Thunderball and Diamonds Are Forever, but the fact his entire series of work on the Bond films goes unrecognised while other composers get look-ins is weird to say the least, but then he was responsible for that slide whistle in The Man with the Golden Gun, so maybe they just nominated Marvin Hamlish out of spite for that reason alone. And while we're talking about Bond's 70s Academy achievements, we of course can't overlook the fact that in this decade, Roger Moore himself took home a Best Actor Oscar. It wasn't his award to take home, but he did it anyway. I just love this story. So at the ceremony in 1973, Roger and Liv Ullman were presenting the Oscar for Best Actor, and Marlon Brando won, but Brando was not present at the award ceremony, and instead he used the opportunity to send Sasheen Littlefeather in his place, and she refused the award on his behalf in protest against Hollywood's portrayal of Native Americans. So Roger is left holding the Oscar, and no one takes it from him, like, all night. He talks about this in his autobiography, like, no one was asking for it back, and he's leaving the ceremony, he's going home, and people are gathered outside the venue seeing him leave with an Oscar and they're shouting, well done, and then he gets back and his daughter's absolutely thrilled when 
and she sees him with it, and he, all the while he's having to sell people like, yeah, no, it's not mine. And indeed, apparently the next day a van arrived and did take the Oscar away, but I would have just loved it if Roger could have kept it. Like, it would have been such a weird bit of movie trivia that Marlon Brando's Oscar for The Godfather ended up in the possession of Roger Moore. How random would that be? Into the 80s now, and Moonraker is nominated at the 1980 Oscar ceremony for visual effects. Much deserved, I say, but bloody hell, how did that thing not win for those effects? I mean, it looks absolutely stunning. I can't imagine what it would lose up again. Oh, Alien. Oh, okay. Huh. Yeah, well, may maybe that's fair enough, but who'd have thought Moonraker would be a Oscar-nominated film of all of them? Anyway, there's another nomination for Bond in a couple of years' time for Best Original Song for Fior Eyes Only. Again, not written by John Barry. I mean, seriously, did they just have a bet going at this point that they were going to nominate every Bond theme he wasn't involved in? Fior Eyes Only lost the Oscar to Arthur's theme from Arthur, but the ceremony nonetheless staged a pretty big-scale musical number around the song, with Sheena Easton appearing on stage, singing live, with Harold Sakata reprising his role of Odd Job from Goldfinger and Richard Keel as Jaws. And I guess if you ever wanted to see Bond by way of Andrew Lloyd Webber, this is it. I mean, it's weird as anything, and I can only assume that this set is making use of leftover dressings from Logan's run or something like that. It's not very Bondian. I get that Moonraker was still probably very fresh in people's minds, but the lasers, the rockets, the costumes, it's all so sci-fi. We're not science fiction. We're, in fact, science fact. It is, however, truly glorious camp, and I'll leave a link below to the full version. I'd just love it if this thing got released in better quality somewhere down the line. Maybe the production horrified a good few members of the Academy, though, because after this, it's going to be 31 years before the Bond series is nominated for another Oscar. In the intervening years, though, Bond actors continue to make appearances at the ceremonies, acting as presenters and handing out trophies. There's a particularly memorable appearance from both Sean Connery and Roger Moore on stage alongside Michael Caine that's just lovely. I'm not on this list. I don't understand it. What's your name? My name is Bond. Bond? Fun. Oh. In 1982, producer Cubby Broccoli was presented with the Irving G. Thalberg Memorial Award, which was presented to him by Roger Moore, and God, I really hope they were paying Roger for all of these Oscar appearances, or was he just turning up every single year in the hopes that there'd be more no-shows and he might actually make it away with one of the trophies? And of course, Sean Connery wins his very own Oscar for his role in The Untouchables, thus far being the only Bond actor to actually win an Academy Award, though, as we've established, only the second to actually take one home with him. Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, and a few enemies. Uh <laughs> Zipping ahead to the 2013 Oscar ceremony, and Skyfall breaks all previous Bond Oscar records by being nominated for five trophies and winning two Best Original Song and Best Sound Editing. It was also nominated for Sound Mixing, Cinematography, and Original Score for Thomas Newman's work on the film. And I feel like David Arnold can join John Barry in the WTF unsung Bond composer category with this. Like, I really like Thomas Newman's Skyfall score, don't get me wrong, but David Arnold had five awesome scores in a row and didn't even get a nod and it's crazy. Also slightly crazy, Casino Royale didn't get any kind of Oscar nod, and that's weird, because <laughs> I think many regard it as being the best of Craig's era, and indeed one of the best of the whole series. It's popular with both audiences and critics, and it got a heck of a lot of BAFTA nominations, so I'm surprised it didn't get more praise on the other side of the pond. Anyway, back to talking about the 2013 ceremony, which, as well as bestowing Bond with Oscar glory, was also going to feature a fully-fledged tribute to the film series in celebration of its 50th anniversary, which, of course, it was celebrating the previous year in 2012. Finally, a great excuse to shower some Academy love on this iconic titan of cinema, but what could they possibly do that could suffice a fitting tribute to this series? Well, if your answer to that is have Halle Berry introduce a clip montage, you'd be agonizingly correct. Yes, satisfying to, I imagine, no one, this bafflingly low-key tribute was how the Academy sought to shine a light on the Bond series. I mean, nothing against Tally Berry at all, I really like her as an actress and it makes sense for her to be here given that she's both a Bond girl and an Oscar winner, but couldn't they have roped in some more former cast members to make this moment really memorable? At one stage there were rumours galore that all six Bond actors were going to appear on stage together at this ceremony, and given that that had never happened before, I 
I and many other people were really excited about this prospect. This was possibly the last great opportunity to get all of these actors together in one place at one time. And I mean, this is all kind of rumor mill stuff, but apparently Sean Connery was the last holdout, and so these plans were axed. But it's such a shame. This could have been a really special moment, but instead it just feels kind of rushed looking back on it. Some solace can be found in the appearance of Dame Shirley Bassey, though, who appeared and absolutely kicked it out of the park with a rendition of Goldfinger. You know, that Bond song that didn't get an Oscar nomination, but whatever. She was absolutely sensational. She sounds amazing. And hey, Adele performed Skyfall in that ceremony too, so a double bill of great Bond songs. I'm happy enough with that. And indeed, it seems like now Bond songs are all the rage, nominations-wise, as Writings on the Wall from Spectre won Best Original Song in 2016, and now No Time to Die is nominated in that same category, with that latter film also picking up nominations for Best Sound and Best Visual Effects. But who knows, if Daniel Craig turns up as a presenter at the ceremony and Will Smith or Benedict Cumberbatch don't turn up, he may well end up walking out of there carrying an Oscar himself. Just learn from Roger's mistakes, and when the Academy arrived the next morning to pick it up, pretend you don't have it. While I guess I was initially a little surprised that No Time to Die didn't get more nominations, looking back on Bond's past Oscar history, I guess that it has still done quite well for itself. And as I say, these films do not need gold statues to be popular or have a lasting effect in people's minds. And indeed, barring the occasional notable exception, the Academy Awards just ain't in the habit of showering big budget entertainments with prizes. And that's okay. No Time to Die is the fourth highest grossing film of 2020. 21, second only to Spider-Man No Way Home if we're talking about non-Chinese releases, so that in itself should be validation enough for the film. But do not get me started again on that whole John Barry thing. My god, how did that guy not get nominated for any of his Bond songs? I just, I can't believe it. If you have not already subscribed to this channel, please do consider scrolling below and clicking the subscribe button, as well as the Mrs. Bell notification button to stay super up to date on future video uploads that I make on this channel. Also below, you can leave a comment to let me know your own feelings about James Bond's history at the Academy Awards. Are there any films that you think really, really deserved to be nominated in categories that they were kind of ignored in? I mean, I'm looking back at the series, I think the vast majority of the theme songs at least deserved nominations, but um, yes, do let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. And of course, there are the usual links to my social media pages, so my Twitter page, my Facebook page, my Instagram page, and my Patreon page, for those of you who want to go one extra step in supporting this channel. And with all that being said, and until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.